My one ambition is to get all Americans to realize that they are and must continue to be the greatest race on the face of this old earth. Buzz Windrup, a senator who later became the first dictator president of the United States. And second, to realize that whatever apparent differences there may be among us in wealth, knowledge, skill, ancestry, or strength, though of course all of this does not apply to people who are racially different from us. We are all brothers, bound together in the great and wonderful bond of national unity, for which we should all be very glad. That excerpt from It Can't Happen Here, the 1935 novel by Sinclair Lewis. Well, I think that citing Sinclair Lewis is a good place to start. It's actually a very good novel in a journalistic way. And one of the things that Lewis taps into in that novel of the 1930s is the way that fascism, when it came to America, would have an American face. Adam Gopnik is a writer with The New Yorker, a former Massey lecturer, and a frequent contributor to Ideas. His Fuhrer, his, his American Duce, is a, a figure of the 30s. He's companionable, and he has a hearty uh, Will Watchers kind of quality. And not surprisingly, Donald Trump uh, has a celebrity television, reality uh, TV quality. That's the face that uh, fascism, let's not uh, mince words, will take in America. I think it's a mistake, actually, Paul, to think that there's some neat causal sequence here, uh, globalization or the uh, the economic downturn of 2008 is responsible for alienating a great many white working class people and therefore they turn to a character like Trump. As you know, that's a very familiar analysis. And obviously when we're talking about groups of hundreds of millions of people, there are bound to be individuals who fit that description. But I think at a, a deeper level, the real question I think worth asking isn't so much how does ethnic nationalism assert itself in Trump's case or in any other case, but how have we stayed outside it for as long as we have? How are we able to uh, insist on the norms or persuade people to accept the norms of a pluralist society? And that, I think, is in a way the right way to see it is to see it the other way around, because we know that left to their own devices, uh, human beings, tragically, always tend to uh, devolve, if you like, towards uh, ethnic nationalist politics. If I had to guess about why we've had this uprising in the past year in America, I do think it's a consequence, a kind of built-in attraction repulsion of the Obama years. And the, the real paradox of this moment, I think, Paul, is that simultaneously you see the rise of call it what you will, populist authoritarianism, ethnic nationalism, call it fascism with an American face. At the same time as you see that Barack Obama remains an extraordinarily popular figure, the most popular American president at the end of his term, certainly since Clinton, and more popular even than Ronald Reagan was. And it's clear that those of us who see Barack Obama as essentially a centrist, liberal, pluralist figure fail to understand that he's a figure of enormous and kind of uh, primordial threat to a great many of uh, our American countrymen, that he's seen not as a conciliatory figure, but as a deeply disruptive figure. And what he disrupts are the continuities of white American nationalism. But if I was to turn that question upside down, then why haven't we seen earlier instances of this kind of political phenomenon, call it fascism or whatever, why hasn't that appeared frequently in American history in the past? Well, I think it has. I think the answer is that it has. Now, we could ask, why is it that it's never before come this close to power? And that, I think, is a reasonable question. But I wish we could look at American history without seeing exactly this kind of demagogic white ring nationalism, but we can't. You know, one of my favorite moments where you see it coming up goes all the way back to um, Mark Twain's descriptions of America before the Civil War. If you read about, if you remember Huck Finn's pap, in the great novel, Huckleberry Finn, you'll remember that Pap, the town drunk, who's abusive and absurd, when he gets drunk enough, he l- launches into a screed about how this government ain't a government anymore. Um, and why isn't it a government? It's because they allow free blacks to vote. Oh, yes, this is a wonderful government. Wonderful. Well, looky here. 
There was a free n from Ohio, a mulatto, most as white as a white man. He had the whitest shirt on you ever see, too. And, and he picks on an uppity black man, uncannily like Barack Obama. And the shiniest hat. And there ain't a man in that town's got as fine clothes as what he had. And he had a gold watch and chain and a silver-headed cane. Who he saw being allowed to vote, and it just enraged him. They said he could vote. What is this country a coming to? And it's quite clear that that sense that there needs to be uh, an underclass, that there needs to be uh, a people who are safely beneath embattled uh, white ethnics uh, is a very, very powerful one in American history. So I don't think it is an entirely new thing. And the reasonable question is, is how does it gotten so close to taking power? And that, I think, is a good question. You know, Donald Trump talks about deporting people based on their religion. That would have been inconceivable from a major national politician not that long ago. We're understandably and appropriately reluctant to use the word fascism too liberally, so to speak, hmm. because we understand that the consequences of fascism in Europe were so unimaginably dire that we don't want to stick uh, uh, every populist authoritarian with that same label. But it's not wrong, you know. I had the, um, I don't know whether to call it the good fortune or the ill fortune, to actually read Hitler's Mein Kampf a few months ago. It was being republished in German, and I read it in for the first time in English and in German, drawing on my graduate school German, which is none too good. Nonetheless, one of the things that's startling about it, to read it, is that uh, we think of Hitler because of the ultimate consequences of Hitler as being above all an anti-Semite, and God knows he's an anti-Semite in Mein Kampf. But the theme of the book is make Germany great again. That's what it's all about. And it's exactly the notion that there's a conspiracy against the true Volk, against the true ethnic core of Germany, against the real Germany, as we have the real America, and that that conspiracy takes in both threatening outsiders, Muslims or Mexicans who are going to come in against us, and simultaneously has already subverted the democratic institutions so that the people in Weimar Germany, the, the liberal Democrats, were themselves tools of these conspiring outsiders. And we have exactly the same pattern with Trump and Trumpism. Uh, so Obama is an alien outsider who's truly, something's going on, is Trump's formula, meaning that he's really in league with the Muslim terrorists who are coming uh, to get us. So that form, not only of hyper-extended nationalism, but of a nationalism that depends on a pervasive outside threat that has already taken over the institutions of the so-called democracy, that's exactly the core ideology of what we properly call fascism. Yes, we have to look at mosques and we have to respect mosques. But yes, we have to see what's happening because something is happening in there. Man, there's anger. There's anger. And we have to know about it. We One of the crucial things to see always, Paul, is that it, that kind of feeling doesn't need an economic cause to assert itself. You know, one of the greatest mistakes of uh, progressive politics and of left-wing analyses in the 20th century seems to me the belief that all political action ultimately has an economic cause, so that if people are turning to a figure like Trump, white working-class men, for instance, who are the core of his support, that it must be because they're under some kind of economic stress. But every correlation you can see, every search for what is it that these people have in common finds very little economic causation, very little economic pain that they all have in common, and an enormous sense of racial beleaguerment, an enormous sense of threatened identity. And so for the people like Trump who say, let's make America great again, what they really mean in plain English is let's make America white again.